Anyway, let me repeat it. Welcome to Bible Believers Community Church. I'm Pastor Jeff, and um, it sure is a pleasure for you to be here. Today is Wednesday, March 2nd, 2022, and we're studying the book of John. Uh, we're doing an expository study on the book of John, and if you would, please turn in your Bibles to John chapter 6. We're moving right along now in John chapter 6. John 5 took forever. But John chapter 6 is moving right along. Look, look at verse 15. The Bible says, When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. And when even was now come, his disciples went down into the sea and entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark and Jesus was not come to them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. So when they had rowed about five or twenty, five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship. And they were afraid. But he said unto them, It is I, be not afraid. Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we do thank you for this for your word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that guides us and teaches us and helps us to learn. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, bless this message today, Lord, that it would um, be pleasing to you, that you'd help me to say the exact things you want said and to refrain from saying anything that you don't want said. We love you and we do this whole church thing for your praise, your honor, and your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. So uh, this was built up from Jesus feeding the 5,000, and that's what we looked at last year. We looked at the feeding of the 5,000, and it's always referred to as the feeding of the 5,000, but it's truly far more than 5,000 people. Uh, let's just real quick look at Matthew 14, 21 again. Matthew 14, 21. In Matthew 14, 21, it says, and they that, talking about the same exact event, it says, and they that had eaten were about 5,000 men beside women and children. So if you have 5,000 men, and even if only half of those men were married, and I'm sure 90% of them were married, but even if only half of them were married, that takes you from 5,000 to 7,500. And if they all just had... If all the married couples just had uh, two kids, that would take you well over um, 12, 13, 14,000 people. Yeah. And the reality is back then, families didn't have two kids. Families had eight kids, seven kids, nine kids. And so really, I'm sure that he fed over 25,000 people at this feast that was done with five small loaves of barley bread and, and two small fishes. And we left off with the people being impressed by the uh, miracle. So if you're in John uh, 6, look at verse 14. Then those men, when they had seen that miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. So that prophet, and, and we... They thought that he was that prophet, and they missed the, he, the fact that he was the Messiah. And we went over that prophet last week. We're not going to go over it again, but they missed the fact that he was the Messiah. They thought he was Moses. Yep. They thought he was that prophet. And, and if you say, well, why do you say Moses? Go back and listen to last week's message, amen? Amen. And you'll hear why it was that prophet would be Moses. And so we see in verse 15 that Jesus would avoid becoming their king at this time. It says, when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. And we're going to see something about uh, Jesus and Jesus' character as we study this little bit of scripture. I think there's a couple of reasons why he departed from them and why he went up into a mountain alone. And I think it's also significant that he went up into that mountain alone. He didn't take the 12 apostles with him. 
He didn't take any of the disciples. He didn't take anybody. He went up alone. And that fact by itself brings up, it should bring up a few questions in your mind. No matter where Jesus went, the crowd followed. Somehow Jesus, I think, had to kind of close their eyes so that they uh, couldn't see him going off into a mountain by himself because he'd never get off to the mountain by himself. Um, the crowd would continue to follow him. I mean, here's this guy that is among them that's giving eyesight back to the blind. He's making the dumb uh, loosing their tongues so they can speak. He's healing leprosy. He's raising the dead. He, and here he's feeding probably well over 20,000 people with five loaves of bread and two small fishes. So they weren't going to let him out of their sight. They're going to follow him wherever he goes. And, and from this point on, Jesus' ministry is not really a private ministry. It's a ministry that is uh, very um, um, open and attended. And people from all over are coming to see because the word of his abilities and his miracles are spreading up about. So what are the couple things that I think makes this significant? One is, and this is a primary thing, with God, everything's about timing. Everything's about timing. And you hear people say, you know, pray for this. Uh, and, and especially when you're communicating with missionaries, they often refer to God's timing. You know, well, it just must not be God's timing right now. And certainly I've even said it about this church is this church doesn't seem to grow physically here on the premises. It's growing on the internet. And by the way, you internet folks, thank you for joining us. Um, it's growing pretty well on the internet, but as far as locally here in Alamosa, uh, tonight it's me and my wife, amen. And that's okay because God's timing is perfect whether we understand it whether we don't understand it and with jesus it was everything so we're going to look at some verses here it says god is a god of timing look at john chapter 2 and verse 4 john chapter 2 and verse 4 and what we're looking at here it's a wedding feast it's a wedding feast and they ran out of wine and his mom comes to him and says uh they're out of wine uh and, and uh, implying that she wanted him to do something about it, to get them some wine. And verse four says, Jesus saith unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. You see, timing is everything to him. He's not gonna start his earthly ministry early. He's not gonna start it late. And we as Christians, when, especially when we're talking about the return of the Lord, we, we say things like, if the Lord, and I say it all the time. I'm not criticizing people that say that, but we say all the time, if the Lord tarries, um, we'll do this and we'll do that. And if the Lord tarries, this is going to happen. But, uh, you know, in, in reality, God is a God of timing and he is not going to tarry one second. When the time is right for him to come back, he's going to be back. The trumpet's going to blow. He's going to come and we'll wrap this thing up and King Jesus will set up his kingdom on earth. Earth, And certainly before that happens, there's got to be the rapture of the church because uh, the church is not going to go through the great tribulation. But with God, everything is about timing. Amen. And so Jesus consistently throughout all four gospels talks about his hour, his hour, his hour. And so look at John chapter seven and verse six. John chapter 7 and verse 6. Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hateth me, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Go ye up unto this feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. Now, you know, all the new Bibles, they change verse 8. They say that uh, he's not going to go up to the feast. It just says, I go not up to the feast. But what Jesus said is, I go not up yet, because he ended up going to that feast. 
He just wasn't going at the time that the other disciples wanted to head out. <laughs> he said, it's not my time yet. You guys go. And he went up after they went. And so you say, well, what difference does that make that the new Bibles take out the word yet? Because by taking out the word yet, you make Jesus a liar. Because if you take out the word yet, he says, I'm not going to the feast. And then he goes. So he's a liar. <laughs> and Jesus isn't a liar. So that Amen. yet has to be there. And so um, here we see in from verse six down to verse eight, uh, two times he's talking about his timing. Uh, in verse six, he says, my, uh, my time is not yet come, but your time is already. And so um, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us one thing, that our time and Jesus' time are not necessarily the same. Amen. And then in verse 7, it says, The world cannot hate you, but it hateth me, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Now, that was a time-specific statement, because later on, Jesus says, If they hate me, they're going to hate you. <laughs> if you're going to go out and preach, they're going to hate you. And I've experienced that. People that, I mean, you start talking about how evil and how wicked the world is. And folks, nothing's changed. The world is evil and wicked. Um, sex trafficking is out of control. Drug use is out of control. Homosexuality uh, is out of control. You say, well, wait a second. That's a, no, no, that's, you gotta be politically correct. You can't talk about homosexuality. No, homosexuality is a sin. And, I, and I'm not picking on the homosexual because adultery is a sin and straight people that commit adultery are sinners. Amen. <laughs> and uh, the world's just filled with sin. Uh, drug use, um, um, disregard for uh, civil authorities. The Bible says that we're supposed to live peaceably among men. And that doesn't include going down and breaking out store windows and looting uh, they say it's to protest this, that, and the other, but it's really just to loot and get the stuff for free. It's, it's theft. Theft is out of control. Uh, governments are out of control. Everything seems to be out of control because why is everything out of control? Because we live in an evil world yes. that's being run by evil forces. We fight not against flesh and blood, but against powers and in high places and spiritual darkness and wickedness. It's a spiritual battle. And that battle started before God even created Adam and even before he even created uh, this world. He created, um, he had a rebellion in, in heaven. And that rebellion is based on evil. And that evil still exists. So his timing in, in uh, John chapter 7, verses 6 through 8, is he talks about timing, timing, timing. Drop down to verse 30. Verse 30. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him because his hour was not yet come. Now, the devil's trying to get, I mean, if, if you're in any doubt as to who's going to win this battle, you need to look at verses like that. Satan would have destroyed him from the womb. Couldn't do it. Satan had Herod kill every child in the region from two years old and downward uh, and younger because he knew that Jesus was born within that time period and his hope, and it was actually Satan's hope because our battle's not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness and powers. And so Satan's trying to destroy this Messiah before while he's still a child under two years of age, but he couldn't do it. And here they're trying to take him, but they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him because his hour was not yet come. See, there's a battle going on, but God is totally in control of that timing. Totally in control. Satan can't do anything without God allowing him to do it. And you say, then why do all these bad things happen in the world? Because I certainly can't imagine that God knowingly and willingly allows things to happen, but he does. He does allow evil to hit us. He does allow wicked things to happen to us. He does allow hurtful things to happen to us. And it's not because he's an evil God. There's, and I talk about this over and over again. There's two things that played on this. And one is free will. 
of all mankind, well, actually, of all of his creation. You know, the angels have free will. If they didn't, Satan wouldn't have rebelled with a third of the angels. They had a free will to decide to go against God. All of God's creation has a free will, even down to your pet dog. You know, your pet dog, you can say, come here, and sometimes he'll come, and sometimes he won't. He has a free will. He can do what he wants to do, and, and uh, you know, we train them to where they will obey, and, and that's part of taking your kids to church, training them so they will obey, and not just go off on their own will, but the timing, God is in control of that timing. And we do have this promise, and we talked about it a lot last week, and that is Romans 8, 28. All things work together for the good, for those that love the Lord, to those that are the called according to his purpose. And so even if the bad things do happen in your life, whether you understand it, whether you don't understand it, it is for your good. It is for your good. And instead of mealy-mouthing and griping and complaining, you need to offer this. And I'm not saying put on a fake praise where it's, Oh, I just lost whatever. I lost my job. I lost my favorite pet, whatever. I lost my, my spouse. Praise the Lord. I'm so happy. I'm not talking about that. The Bible talks about the sacrifice of praise. Yes. Sometimes you don't feel like praising, but you can still, and we're seeing this in the book of Job, that Job lost more than probably anybody that could hear this message ever lost in their life. And he said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He praised the Lord in his turmoil. He praised the Lord in the bitterness of his soul. He praised the Lord when everything was going wrong. But we're not really talking about that. That's just kind of a side trail. What we're talking about is the timing and God's timing. And the rapture of the church uh, is a set time and a set uh, date and a set um, hour, a set minute. And it's based off of Israel's time, I'm sure, not the world's time. Yeah. And uh, so that is set in concrete. And when that time period comes, uh, there, there's a bunch of uh, theologians out there that believe that somehow man is in control of that timing and that uh, man's going to um, take the world to a certain place of betterment and then God can come down and just take over the throne. Well, that's nonsense. The world's not getting better. The world's getting worse. Uh, there's another line of thought out there that God has a certain number of people that need to be saved. And when that last person, you know, whatever that number is, if the number's, and I'm just going to throw a number out there, if the number's 10, <laughs> then when the ninth person is saved, that next person, whoever that might be, boom, we're out of here. Well, that's nonsense too. Jesus implied that the Father knew the day and the hour. He said, no man knoweth the day or the hour, but the Father which is in heaven. So clear back then, that time was set. God is a God of timing. Look at John chapter 8 and verse 20. John chapter 8 and verse 20. The Bible says, these words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple. And no man laid hands on him for his hour was not yet come. You, you know something that's peculiar about all those verses? They wanted to lay hands on him. They wanted to obliterate him. They wanted to kill him. Yeah. They wanted to stamp his existence off this earth. They wanted to do every. They wanted to destroy his teachings. They wanted to destroy his thought processes. They wanted to completely wipe him out. And it's not because of them. Because our battle's not against flesh and blood. They are being controlled by spirits, by powers, by higher authorities, uh, by wickedness in high places. They're controlling them. And those same wicked forces want to control us. And sometimes they have victory in controlling us, which is a shame. As Christians, uh, we're sottish, we're stupid. We should be able to grab hold of the blood of Christ and, and thank God that the blood of Christ cleanses us regardless of what our flesh does. Praise the Lord for that. But we should be able to have victory far more than we have victory. But we're sottish and we yield to those powers and the timing of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God. It's everything. So that's one reason. 
One reason why he departed into a mountain by himself, because his time was not yet come, and to him, timing is everything. What's the second reason why he might have departed into a mountain by himself? Well, as we said and seen, time and time and time again in his ministry, Jesus measures everything by the heart. He measures everything by the heart. We had a, a, an older gentleman that used to come to this church a long time ago, and he always talked about, because he was, he was in his late 70s, I think. Oh, I think he was in his late 70s. And, and, um, but he was at a point where he contemplated things a lot more probably than he did when he was younger. And he used to come to our house when it wasn't church service time and he'd talk and visit and want to pray. And, and, and he'd say things like, you know, I, I'm, I'm really trying to evaluate what my motives are. Yeah. Well, that's healthy. <laughs> what are your motives? Because God's going to evaluate your motives. What are your motives? Are your motives um, an attempt to um, just make yourself look good? in front of other people? Well, if that's the case, when you make yourself look good in front of other people, you've got your reward. What are your motives? And not just what are your motives for doing good, what are your motives for everything you do? <laughs> what is the, your motives for the type of food you eat? What are your motives for the type of beverages that you drink? What are your motives for what you do in the late part of night? What's your motive for going out to a restaurant? What's your motive for watching a movie? Man, if we could just focus on those things, maybe we'd live a better life. And uh, most movies coming from Hollywood, they, they don't feed your spirit, they feed your flesh. And um, we just don't watch a whole bunch of stuff. As a matter of fact, I, I don't think I could name you two movies. I don't, right now, I couldn't name you one movie that's present in the theaters. I don't even know if the theaters are open. <laughs> I don't know if COVID still has theaters shut down or not. I just don't know. And that's a good place to be because there's nothing coming out of Hollywood. And, and it doesn't matter. You know, those um, um, comic book movies, and I can't even think of the name of one of them. Oh, Iron Man's the name of one of them. One of them was called Iron Man. Those comic book um, movies, they're just loaded with satanic symbology and satanic um, phraseology. They're just loaded with it. And if you if you say that's not true, do some research on your own. It's not hard to find it. <laughs> uh, you can go on the internet and 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 just ask the question. Uh, do these um, I don't know what to call them other than superhero movies. That's what you could call them. Do the super uh, superhero movies have demonic messaging in them and there'll be all kinds of research that comes up and, sh and shows you point by point where those demonic messages are yeah uh, i actually was sitting in a church once in montana where a preacher showed a snippet from one of those shows i don't know which show it was but it had all of them in it, it had the hulk in it it had um captain america i don't know the superheroes <laughs> i'm not gonna be able but there was a scene where the bad guy uh, Hulk had cornered the bad guy and the bad guy said uh, uh, don't you know I'm a god and the Hulk grabbed him and smashed him back and forth into a cement floor and what he was actually imprinted into the cement floor and as the Hulk's walking away he goes puny god well that's not glorifying God Almighty no hmm God measures everything by our heart. And so back here in John chapter 6, and they're wanting to make him a king, but their heart wasn't in the right place for them to make him a king. There was two things that were wrong there. The timing wasn't right, and their hearts weren't right. And you say, well, I just don't understand why God doesn't do this or God doesn't do that. Well, maybe it's time to evaluate your own heart. Believe me, I've done a lot of heart examination in this church. And um, I've even uh, gone so far when I can't come up with something, asking my wife, Is, am I doing something wrong that you're aware of? Or, and she uh, searches her heart. And, and so 
I, it's not a necessity that there's something wrong with your heart because there's two elements at play, God's timing and your heart. And there's a multiplicity of hearts. You say, well, why isn't that ministry going? Well, it could be the hearts of the people in the community. Yeah. And it could be that it's all to do with God's timing. Maybe someday it's going to flourish and, and God's going to bring all kinds of people in. But see, here's the thing that most lay people don't understand. It doesn't really matter whether anybody comes here or not. I'm called to preach here and I'm going to do it. And I'm going to yeah. do it the best I can. And I'm going to pray over it and ask God to bless it. And that's what we're going to do. So in our text, Jesus could see that they failed to see what was going on. And we're going to go into that in more detail later. So he just fed them. They had their belly filled with food. You know, there's a, a, a common thing that you're going to notice about the Lord Jesus Christ as you go through the Gospels. When the timing is wrong or the situation is wrong, he simply avoids the situation that's right in front of him. Sometimes it's somebody asks him a question and he just ignores the question and goes off into his own dissertation on something completely different because the timing's not right. And sometimes, like the case here in, in um, John chapter 6, he retreated from the crowd into a mountain all by himself alone. Um, sometimes he, he would do something like that. Certainly in the Garden of Gethsemane, he told his apostles, you wait here, I'm gonna go yonder and pray. And he took his three inner circle with him, but they only got to go so much closer. And then he told them, you wait here and pray, and I'm gonna go up yonder and pray. And so he has this habit of avoiding a situation when the situation isn't right, when the timing isn't right, when the hearts of people aren't right. He's not gonna force you to get saved. That's a good example. He's not going to, he, he's not willing that any should perish, but he's not going to force you to get saved. He's not going to force you to go to church. He's not going to force you to help out in a ministry. He's not, he's a gentleman. If you don't want to do it, don't do it, but he's going to evaluate your heart and every human being, whether lost or saved is going to go through a judgment where all their motives get reviewed. Amen. Look at Mark chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. Mark chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. But Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him and from Judea. So here's a situation where the timing's not right. He just withdraws himself or he avoids it or he ignores it. God's not going to be rushed. And his timing is so important to him. It doesn't matter if you beg, plead, cry. Um, it really doesn't matter what you do. His timing is going to be fulfilled. Um, in our text, remember that this is the first Advent. This isn't the second Advent. And that has a huge thing to do with his timing. As I pointed out earlier, as we're studying the book of John, there's at least uh, three-fourths of the, probably higher than that, probably 80% of the prophecies of the Messiah in the Old Testament are in conjunction with the second Advent, not with the first Advent. And so, the timing in this one, his crown isn't going to be a crown of people that are happy that that um, he fed them and he's going to they're going to make him king. His crown is going to be a crown of thorns. Look at Isaiah 53. His crown at this first advent is going to be a crown of thorns. Look at verse 7, Isaiah 53, 7. It says he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as sheep before their shears is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgressions of my people 
was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He, he's not going to get a crown of jewels and of gold at this first advent. He's going to get a crown of thorns. So let's take a look at some timing issues in the Bible. Amen. Look at Matthew chapter 14 and verse 22. Matthew 14, 22. Matthew 14 and verse um, 22. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him into the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. This is the same uh, circumstance, just a different account of it. And when the evening was come, when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. The picture of Jesus returning is in the fourth watch. Amen. And, and sometimes people read this stuff and they don't stop to think about what it's saying. And the, he's coming back. Here the, the uh, apostles are in this ship and the raging sea is a picture of the tribulation and he comes back in the fourth watch. Amen. That's the second advent. And so uh, the master of the house returns in the morning. In the morning, look at Mark chapter 13, verse 35. Mark 13, 35. Got to pay attention to the wording when you're reading your Bibles, amen. Mark 13 and verse 35. Lest suddenly he come, excuse me. Lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. Uh, look up at verse 35. Watch ye therefore, you know not when the master of the house cometh at even or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. The implication is that he's going to come in the morning. So, you know, you don't sleep till noon. <laughs> and of course, that's spiritual, not physical, because all the time as far as one o'clock in the afternoon or whatever, it's based on Israel time. And it might be morning in Israel and be evening here. So, the point isn't about whether you're in bed or whether you're not in bed. The, the point is, is how are you serving the Lord? Yes. Are you are you serving him haphazardly? Are you serving him uh, or are you just not serving him? Your idea is he's not, I don't think he's coming back anytime soon. I think we have a ways to go. And so I'm just not gonna, I'm not gonna do anything for him. I'm just gonna live my life Eat, drink, and be buried because tomorrow we die. Well, that's a sorry state of affairs. And, and it's the people that think that way that when he does come back, you're going to get caught with your pants down. And, and I don't mean that in a, in a flippant way. I mean, you're going to be caught in a compromising position that you don't want to be caught in. So this present dispensation is likened to the old ship of Zion passing through stormy waters while the captain is upstairs on Mount Zion. Jesus went up into a mountain and he sent his followers away into a ship. <laughs> huh. Look at Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10. Hebrews 2.10. Now, I love comparing scripture with scripture. You guys know that I do. And I think you learn so much more from the Bible by doing that. Hebrews 2.10, it says, For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain, the captain of the ship, the captain of their salvation pit perfect through sufferings. The captain, there's your captain right there. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's up in the Mount Zion. <laughs> right now he's up 
at the third heaven, sitting on the right hand of God, waiting for the timing to be just perfect. And the next step that he's going to do for that perfect timing isn't come back. The next step is going to be come up hither. And every Christian that's a true born-again Christian, not somebody that's just playing church, every true born-again Christian that had confessed with their mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in their heart that God has raised him from the dead and believe in, in um, um, confessing that he's God, believing that he raised from the dead, believing in the resurrection, those people who truly fit that bill, as soon as the come up hither, they're going to be gone. In a twinkling of an eye, the Bible says. Amen. And it's funny, science tries to deny the Bible left and right, but you know what they try, What they did scientifically? They tried to scientifically determine how much time a twinkling of an eye takes. Yeah. And scientifically, it takes one thirty-second of a second. <laughs> That's pretty doggone quick. And so it's going to be, we're here one minute, we're gone the next. And there's going to be all kinds of reasons and excuses and the world's going to buy the lie because the Bible says a strong delusion is going to be sent. And so that's the next thing. And then we're going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ after we're raptured out of here. And you say, well, preacher, I, you've already lost me because rapture is not even in the Bible. The word rapture is not in the Bible. You're right. The word rapture is nowhere to be found in the Bible. Rapture is a name that humans gave to the concept, but the concept of the rapture is clearly contained in Thessalonians and other passages of Scripture. The Bible says, uh, uh, The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together in the, to meet them in the clouds. Amen? That's the rapture of the church. It doesn't call it a rapture, but that's what it is. And when somebody says rapture, that's what they're referring to. And so look at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 22. Hebrews 12, 22. We saw who our captain is. It says, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, unto a city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Man, that's going to be, so he's in Mount Zion now. And so he, he sends his people away in a ship <laughs> and he goes up into a mountain away from them. Mm -hmm. And then in the fourth watch, he comes back. <laughs> yes. Ooh, <laughs> that's some pretty cool stuff if you stop and think about it, amen? So this is typified in our text. John six fifteen. he retreated to a mountain. Why did he retreat to a mountain? Another case where you got at least two reasons. One is timing. We've already talked about that. But another one, you, you know, something else about God in his word, it is loaded with typology. Yes. And it's loaded with pictures of future events. And that shows the sovereignty of God. It shows the sovereignty of God because he lets his creation just wander this globe doing whatever they want to do without any interference from him. I mean, he may send some circumstance in their life, but without any interference from him, they can just do whatever they want to do. And historically, things that happen end up being pictures yeah. and types of what his overall plan is. Man, that's just... If that doesn't blow your mind, I, I don't think anything could blow your mind. So you're still there in Hebrews chapter 12. Look at verse 23. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to, the, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect man. He's our captain. Uh, we're in that ship of Zion. He's up in Mount Zion and he's going to take us back and, and we're going to be with an innumerable company of angels. You know, I've often thought about how many angels are there? Well, we know a third of them left. And Jesus said when he was talking to Peter, when Peter lopped off the ear of, of the high priest servant, Jesus said, don't you know that I could call on my father and he'd send 12 legions of angels? 
And it wouldn't take 12 legions of angels to completely destroy this world. What is that? One angel killed 180,000 men in one night, didn't even get a blister on his hand doing it. <laughs> 12 legions of angels. Let's go back to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And let's look at verse 22. But we were talking about it. Just go back up to 21. Then they willingly received him into a ship, into the ship. And immediately the ship was at the land, whether they went. That's called hyperspace. <laughs> it didn't say immediately the ship started heading towards land. They're out in the middle of the sea and the storm's keeping them from going forward or backward. They're just kind of stuck there in the sea. Here comes the Lord Jesus Christ walking on the water. Yeah, and you know that we're stuck in that sea. We're stuck in that sea of humanity. And, and sometimes it doesn't feel like we're getting anywhere. We're not going forward. We're not going backward because people are fickle and the waves of every wind of doctrine comes and grabs hold of them. And, and they, they don't have any um, stick to itedness. They're fickle. And we're in this sea being tossed to and from, fro and, and not seeming to be able to get away. And as soon as Jesus came back and walking on water and he said, it's me, don't be afraid. It is I, be not afraid. And they willingly received him into the ship. Certainly we have a different account where Peter went out and walked on water for a few steps. But as soon as Jesus got into that ship, it was immediately at the land whether they went. Now we're in this sea of life and when Jesus goes, come up hither, immediately we're going to be on dry land where we're heading. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. So verse 22, it says, The day following when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there save that one whereunto his disciples were entered and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, excuse me, the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone, howbeit there came other boats from Tiberias nigh unto the place where they did eat bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me. Notice once again, he just ignored their question. Ye seek me, not because ye saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perish, but for that meat which but for that meat, meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. And that, that whole passage is just loaded with some stuff. These people get up in the next morning and they, they could see, I mean, here's all these ships where Jesus had just fed the 5,000, actually closer to 25,000, and we don't know the exact number. We know that there were 5,000 men, but there were also women and children. And here's all these ships that they all came to see Jesus, and they're looking around. Now, they, they knew that Jesus' ship was gone. They knew that the disciples got into a ship, but they also knew that Jesus didn't get into the ship with them. So these guys are scratching their heads saying, what, what's going on? Where's, where's Jesus? Where, where'd he go? He, he didn't go with his disciples. Well, we can't find him. We know his disciples are over there. Let's go. So they hop in their ships and they go over there. And here he is sitting with his disciples. And they say, when did you come over here? You, you didn't have a boat. You, there was no boat except your disciples. And they, how did you get here? He didn't even answer the question. He addressed their heart. And we see Jesus doing this over and over 
and over again. Jesus was on the mountain of the east side of the sea praying by himself. But when everybody got up the next day, he was over on the west side of the sea with his disciples. He sent the disciples to go before him. Look at Matthew 14, 22. Matthew 14, 22. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. You know, right now Jesus has sent us into a world to go and testify of him yep. and to talk to people about him and to warn them of their condition and uh, to, to let them know that there's a solution to their sin problem. When the people looked for Jesus, they couldn't find him. And so they took sail and went to the other side that the disciples were at. And imagine their surprise when they got over there. They were just probably going over to ask the disciples, where did your master go? Yeah. And they got over there and there's Jesus with them. Imagine their surprise. When did you come over here? <laughs> That's what they asked him, whence camest thou hither? And he ignored their question. And as usual, he cut straight to their heart. You might think that this sounds a little funny. You might think so. Men have the tendency to worship their bellies. Men have the tendency to worship their bellies. Look at uh, verse 27 of of our text John 6 27 labor not for the meat which perisheth but for that but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life for the son of man shall give unto you um, it's verse 26 is the one that I really want verily verily I say unto you you seek me not because of, you saw miracles because you did eat of the loaves and were filled Men worship their bellies. Look at 1 Corinthians 6.13. 1 Corinthians 6.13. Meats for the belly and belly for meats. But God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. So men's thought is about meat for the belly and the bellies for meat. And God says, you should be worried about your relationship with me. You should be worried about where you stand with me. Um, fornication can imply a lot of different things besides just having sex with somebody you're not married to. It could also imply fornication in the form of idolatry because the Bible refers to idolatry as fornication. Mm -hmm. And so here, and I think that's the context because it says now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord. The implications, it's not for these idols that you might serve. It's for the Lord. Amen. Look at Romans 16, 18. Romans 16, 18. Bible says, for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. You know, something that's really peculiar about mankind, and, I, and it's probably goes beyond mankind, but it, it's just something that throughout my life, it just strikes me that somebody can't be bitter on their own. Now I've got to pull other people with them. They always got to try and influence others in a negative way. And, and it's not godly, um, certainly in this text, for they are such that serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. They're going to pull people away with them. 
Their God is their belly. Their God isn't serving God. Their God is their belly. Look at Philippians chapter 3 and verse 19. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 19. It says, whose end is destruction. Well, let's go up to uh, verse 17. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Man, I talk about that all the time. And people just are deceived. Verse 19, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who's, who mind earthly things. These folks are earthly, they're sensual, they're evil. Think of how many people worship a Jesus because in their minds, he gives them pleasure and, and abundance, the gospel of prosperity. Think about that. They don't want Jesus because he saves them from their sins. They want him because of what he can give them right now. Yeah. What's the difference between those people and these people that we're looking at in John where Jesus said, you don't want to make me a king because of the miracles I did. You, you want to make me a king because you, your belly was filled. And you just want me to be your genie. You want me to give you food anytime you want food. And, and many churches today, and it breaks my heart. I hate to always have to bring it up, but it's true. Many churches today are feeding that type of mentality. Come accept Jesus and everything will get good. And you'll get your five loaves and you'll get your two fishes. And he just, he's just um, anxious to bless your socks off. Amen. They want what Jesus can give them now. The Jesus of the Bible is not a God who gives you everything you want. Amen. He's a God that gives you what you need. Yes. Now, especially in America, we often confuse wants for needs. Your needs. Your needs. Your needs are seldom what you're looking for. Maybe you need poverty. You ever think about it in that aspect? <laughs> Maybe in order to walk with God, you need poverty. Maybe you need some sickness in your life. Oh, he'll provide your needs. <laughs> and we think of that as, okay, he's going to get me groceries. He's going to give me a vehicle that runs. He's going to give me a home. Well, Maybe you need family problems in order to turn your affections to God. Maybe, maybe you need family problems. Maybe you need food that isn't so appealing to you. He didn't say he's going to give you your favorite hamburger. He said he'd, he'd supply your needs, your every need, not your good needs, your every need. Most think they need a big house. Most folks think they need a fancy car. Most folks think they need a lot of friends. Usually your friends will turn your heart from God, usually. We're going to end on that thought. We're going to pick up next week with John chapter 6, verse 28. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Lord God, we do thank you for your word. God, we pray that you'd help us to keep a realistic look on what our needs are and be thankful for whatever you provide us. God, this is some hard stuff that we're studying and, and, and I don't even think I can even convey how hard this stuff is. I just pray that your Holy Spirit would show them things that I am not smart enough to show them because I know this stuff is super deep. Lord, help us. Help us to serve you better. Help us to love you more. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.